Are you tired of the uncertainty involved in the process of selling the Amazon brand you've dedicated years to building? Maybe you've experienced a lack of empathy or values alignment in potential buyers or parties with claims to large amounts of capital with little understanding of what it takes to manage an Amazon brand. And you're ready for a solution that's fast, fair, and painless. If that's you, then stick around for a few moments so I can show you exactly how to maximize the value and improve the experience of selling your Amazon brand by partnering with a world-class acquirer and operator for Amazon businesses. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Behind the Stone, the e-commerce mastermind show. My name is Robert Rungan, and I will be your host. This is the show where we take a deep dive and discuss hot e-commerce topics and share tips that allow decision makers to take their businesses to the next level. Today, I'm gathered with a very, very, very special guest, Zach Flint from D1 Brands. Today, we're going to be talking about buying and selling uh, Amazon businesses and how it will benefit our listeners and viewers. Zach, how are you doing today? I'm so excited to have you on the show. Yeah, really happy to be here, Robert. Thanks for having me on. I'm fantastic. Thanks for the invite. Uh, it's, it's really exciting to be uh, having the conversation about Amazon businesses, how we can partner with them, um, and then obviously all the awesome things about our partnership as well. So happy to be here. Zach, that brings up a really, really great point. So why exactly would an e-commerce brand want to sell their business? Yeah, you know, it's a great question. I think, you know, the, the really wonderful thing about the ecosystem and what Amazon has built and who participates in it is that, you know, the folks all kind of come from all different backgrounds, right? And I think the thing that unites them is that they all have a pretty passionate um, entrepreneurial zeal. And so one of the coolest things about my job as sort of being the head of M&A at D1 Brands is that I, I meet people with, in all different walks of life, all different kinds of interests. And so I think, you know, what you said up front is it makes sense. And I, and I agree with it where, you know, people are kind of out of scale where they're ready to kind of go do the next thing, right? Whether they've an operating brand that they've built for a few years, really grown into something valuable, they got something to be proud of. And now they're looking for someone to take it to the next level, trying to find somebody who has Amazon experience, who's capable and qualified to grow it, has the team behind it to back it up. And they go on and do all different sorts of things in the entrepreneurial realm. Some of them stay in e-commerce. Some of them, you know, take the value that you know, we provide them up front um, to kind of, you know, maybe take some time off and, and well, a well-earned vacation. But it really, it really just kind of runs the gamut. But everybody is sort of looking to get into that next venture. And we try to be that jumping off point because we're really excited to kind of help fund that next, that next thing they're going to look to do. And so we see ourselves as almost like an accelerator of entrepreneurs in that sense, plus, you know, taking over their, their livelihood and their brand that they've built and kind of nurturing and fostering it, just like we would with any of the brands that we've launched ourselves. Yeah. And, and, you know, like you actually brought up a great point there because, you know, there, there's a lot of different business brokerages and, you know, there, there's differences between brokerages, acquirers, and operators themselves, right? So, which brings us right into our next point. So what types of acquirers and Amazon operators are there? You know, can you really define the word third-party seller? Yeah, so it, it's, it's a great question. The, I mean, the ecosystem is sort of starting to professionalize. We're really kind of early innings, right? And so um, right now we're seeing some certain kinds of types of buyers, types of sellers take shape. On the third party side, I mean, it's really kind of what Amazon has done to sort of launch all of these different entrepreneurs within their, within their marketplace. So folks that have a partnership with a the supplier, they've done the product development, they've built the brands, and now they're listed on Amazon. And really, they're kind of in the game of trying to maximize for that kind of consumer demand. There's, um, you know, it's, it's only getting more competitive, right? So it's being a really strong operator, launching product, um, responding to customer feedback, taking that customer feedback and going and launching better products. All of that is in the, is in the, the playbooks of these, of these third-party sellers, but really they're the owners of the brands. Um, and then when they're ready to exit or ready to transition to the next thing, they go find an acquirer. Um, and then that gets into your question about what different types are there. And, you know, this has picked up a lot of steam. You see a, a lot of news articles about the different types of acquirers, folks raising capital, um, you know, it's a little bit too early to tell what the different strategies are, but I know at least our strategy and what we've been trying to, you know, been true to since day one is that we want to be the world's largest and best Amazon native acquirer and operator of e-commerce portfolio brands. So like we want to build a portfolio built on the back of Amazon using our sort of, you know, decade of experience operating on Amazon. Um, so as the launching point in the, in just sort of the, the aggregation of these brands that have already been established and found product market fit, um, that's the Amazon native piece. Um, but but you, you just don't know who else is going to launch a platform. Walmart's getting into the game. Amazon's already ahead of the race. Um, we see these brands as being transferable because they're so quality and they've got so much um, 
goodwill built up amongst the consumer. A product that sells well on Amazon may just sell well on, on a Walmart platform and an Etsy platform. Uh, e-commerce is really kind of in the early innings. And so we started on Amazon, but we're really excited to see how the, how the ecosystem takes shape. So that's our playbook. Um, the other kinds of acquirers, you know, we'll, we'll see, we'll see what their strategy is, but we've been Amazon native and true to that since, since, since our early innings. The, that's really cool. So what, what you're telling me is that D1 Brands is really taking an omni-channel approach, right? You might buy uh, an Amazon business that's selling successfully on Amazon and then expand it to Shopify, WooCommerce, other selling platforms, right? Like Walmart, um, who, whoever the retailer is, right? Uh, because if you have a successful presence on Amazon, you, sh you should be able to leverage existing demand and sell on other platforms successfully, correct? Yeah, that's that's the goal. You know, it's um, you know, there's different market dynamics with each of those the, those channels that you mentioned. Um, mm -hmm. And certainly, we're building out the building out the capabilities and the team and the technology stack to be able to attack those markets. We want to meet consumers where they're shopping and where they are right now. Where they're shopping and where they are is on Amazon, and that's what we've kind of grown up in, and that's what we feel like that we're you know the best in the world at. Um, but there's no reason to think that you know other platforms might catch up. You mentioned D 2 C, the Shopify, and the WooCommerce of the world. Those are a very, very particular use case, but if you can build a relationship with a customer directly, such that they're coming after your brand through your own site, we like you know we put a lot of different you know time and hire the right talent to be able to pursue that niche because a really strong brand on Amazon has the potential to kind of develop a direct customer relationship as well. So we've been exploring that for a while now. We're really excited about that possibility. But right now, the the Amazon is is where the action is at least for us, and that's what we've been focused on. And there's still a lot of room to grow as that whole platform grows. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So, you know, let's connect the dots here, right? So uh, how does the entire process work from, you know, acquiring uh, or from being an acquirer to an operator? How, how does the process work for, you know, somebody that's selling their business or somebody who it wants to get out of the game, right? Like how, how does that whole entire end-to-end -end process work working with D1 Brands? Yeah, I'm really happy you asked. I mean, I think it's it's something that I, we've been really working hard to demystify, right? Because we don't want there to be any sort of information asymmetry between buyers and sellers. We see ourselves definitely as more of a partner. Um, the process actually at, at its base is pretty simple, right? So you you have a brand and you and you basically said, hey, look, I've, I've kind of either taken this to the extent that I want to take it to. Um, I don't want to start hiring a huge team and, and, and you know, achieving growth by managing people that used to do what I'm doing now. So I want to go find a good partner for my brand. So that's where we step in and say, Hey, look, in a couple of days, once you give us information about the brand, we'll look at the storefront, we'll have a conversation with you. I personally just love to hear the origin story. Everyone got into the ecosystem differently. And it's really cool to see how people saw a product or saw a gap in the market and then attacked it by, by using Amazon. So there's always a cool story there. We try to understand that really well, try to understand the seller's needs really well. After that, um, if we find a way to kind of partner with them on, on terms that, that are amenable to them, um, give them fair value for what they've created, um, give them trust in us, because I think, you know, folks want to see that their legacy continues on, right? We're not going to try to buy the brand and then put a D1 brand on it. And, and now it's, it's, it's wiped from the face of the earth. Like I think the sellers that we partner with are really excited to see what we do with their brand going forward. It's what they build. It's their, it's their, you know, it's their legacy in a way. So we try to put a lot of time up front understanding that. Um, and then, you know, like it's the trust building process. And it really only takes from the time we agree on terms, 30 days to get closed. Once we're closed, um, we, we begin operating the business on day one. And so, we don't, we, you know, we like to stay in touch with the sellers and let them know how the, how the business is doing, give them, give them the update on what we're trying, what we're experimenting with, but we don't ask the sellers to stay involved in the business unless they really want to. We make that available to them, but we have a team in place, 75 plus globally, who all they do is operate on Amazon. And we, again, that's our strong suit. And so after 30 days, um, you know, the, sell, the sellers typically, you know, take the, take the cash that, that they've received. Occasionally there's a, there's a piece of it that, that has to do with our, um, our performance post-close. Um, really depends on what the seller is looking for. Um, and then they go do the next thing and we, and we cheer them on and try to help with their next venture as best we can. But that's, that's generally the process for end then. And we can be more specific about any, any different part of that, but that's, it's a pretty simple thing at the end of the day. Yeah, no, that's, that's super, super robust. Actually. It's not just a, Hey, you know, we're in, we're out. Like we come, we buy the business, we give them money and no, you actually help from beginning to end. And even after it's, it's, 
after the business has been sold, you're still looking to help out your customers, right? Starting their next business venture. Any way that you can help out, uh, that makes a lot of sense. And I feel like that's really, really going to help you in terms of like customer retention, referrals, et cetera, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, no, we, the, the more awesome, positive experiences we leave on sellers, those who we partner with or even those who we don't partner with, right? Like the better, the better that we're going to do, because I think folks are going to, at the end of the day, rely on trust, right? There's going to be a lot of money that comes into the space with any new space that's attractive. A lot of money comes in. Some folks are professional and get it and want to and see it for the long term. And some folks are looking to maximize things for the short term. We understand that that's going to shake out. And we want to be one of the ones standing at the end because we've left so many good impressions on sellers. And like you said, there's a flywheel of referrals that come from that. Trusted partnerships. This is a pretty tight ecosystem, right? Like um, you and I know each other, like we're all, we're all, everyone kind of knows each other in the same groups. And so I, I think the word of mouth marketing around who's a trusted partner um, and who maybe, um, you know, is, is, is in it for the wrong reasons, I, I think starts to separate those who are going to build lasting businesses within the space and those who, um, you know, might, might not. Yeah. And you actually hit on it too, right there. Uh, you know, B2B is always, it's still an emotional buy, right? You know, you always hit on those pain points and it's about relationships, right? So if you can really, really, really drive on the emotions that people are going to feel both while they're selling their business and after they're selling their business, right? Like if you're giving them an all around A plus experience, which obviously your, your clients have a tremendous experience working with you guys, it's amazing. Um, but if you can nail those aspects down, like it's just going to be amazing, right? It's just going to continue to spread and grow all the referrals and leads that come in. Um, so let me ask you this. Um, how does that entire process of selling your e-commerce business or CPG brand work for the buyer and the seller? You know, there's two different parties here, uh, two different sets of processes. How does that process work? Sure. Yeah. So we can get we can get a little bit more specific here. So from the seller's perspective, um, I think what I said originally still kind of stands, right? Like motivations um, can vary. I think everyone, obviously, everybody wants to get um, a good price for what they built, right? And that's and that's you know not lost on us. And so we want to make sure that everyone's getting the full value for the brand that they built. I mean, they've sunk years of their life, capital, you know, worked around the clock to make this work, and we want to recognize that by the value that we're delivering to them. So that comes at close, right? Um, and so the other things that might matter to a seller are, um, hey, I want to be involved post-closing with product development, right? You know, I really like these parts of the business and I would like to continue doing that, um, but I don't really like supply chain or marketing or customer service and things like that. So sometimes we, we, we structure a relationship where we're letting the seller um, manage the parts of the business that they like to manage, and then we, we do the rest. Oftentimes, the seller is ready to go do the next thing. Um, but basically, you know, will structure the, both the offer and the process around what the seller's needs are. And also, you know, and this will get into a little bit of what the buyer would look for, right? And I can speak from our perspective. We're looking for really durable products that have, um, you know, a high degree of customer loyalty as expressed through, you know, the review counts on Amazon, the quality of the rating that they have on Amazon. We really look at this through an Amazon lens, right? But I think those same comments would apply to other e-commerce marketplaces as well. We're looking for things that are durable that customers love. And you know, the goal for us post close would ideally be to grow the brands. I mean, we have we've had tremendous success growing our brands post close anywhere from you know two to three times in the first year after after an exit, just because we we feel like we're, we're really strong in this channel and we understand the Amazon ecosystem really well. And that'll come through product development. That'll come through you know more sophistication around advertising types and campaigns. Obviously, technology is a big part of this and using data. Um, so a lot of our team is structured around that. And really, it's just you know. Do we find a brand that customers already love um, that we can kind of keep delivering more value to them through various different ways, whether that's new products, a new marketing angle, uh, a new place to buy by channel expansion. So those are the kinds of brands that we really look for as a buyer, things that are ripe for growth in those avenues, but really already have a strong base, base because the seller, the founder of the brand has, has just really gotten that fire burning really bright on Amazon and is ready to move on to the next thing. And we want to kind of continue you know, adding fuel to it. Yeah, no, that may, again, like you are on top of this, like a hundred percent and, and actually transitions us right into the next thing I was going to talk about. You know, we've talked about, uh, your team of 75 plus people. You've talked about buying, selling e-commerce brands, but 
one thing I want to ask you is how is D1 Brands positioned uh, to help e-commerce brands grow and thrive in the marketplace? Sure. Yeah. So the, you know, the thing, the, the thing to keep in mind um, with at least how we're structured is when we're, when we're kind of coming in and delivering the value that we feel like we're exceptionally qualified to deliver, it's in the context of, you know, either a majority or a 100% acquisition of a brand, right? So we're acquirers as well as operators. So, and that's not to say that we don't launch our own brands and things like that, but that's, a, you know, another strategy of our growth. So on the acquisition side, at least that's, you know, related to my day job and what I'm, what I'm somewhat qualified to talk about is that, you know, when we buy a business, um, we have, a, we, we put together a growth playbook. And so what we're trying to do is just say, what's the nature and the DNA of this brand and where are the most actionable avenues for growth? There's usually things involved in every single brand that if a single person is operating it, they just, you just can't stay on top of all of it. And it's only getting more complicated on Amazon. Advertising is getting more competitive. Um, the way Amazon manages your, your performance under supply chain, particularly if you're leveraging FBA, which is what we, you know, we recommend and what we target in our own portfolio. Uh, there's just a lot to manage. And so there's little tweaks that if you have a large enough team with enough sophistication and enough experience on Amazon that you can make sort of day one um, and really within the kind of the first 30 days as we get our arms around the brand once we own it. Um, and then the growth playbook after that kind of looks different depending on the brand. So what we try to do is, you know, we, we sort of mimic Amazon's hyper focus on customer experience. So we don't want to be penny wise and pound foolish when it comes to pricing, when it comes to, you know, customer service or returns policy. We want to maximize customer value because that's how the platform is really set up from day one. Amazon wants to be a marketplace where customers have an ex excellent experience where they come with a, you know, with a product they have in mind, they search for the product. We obviously want to be the, you know, the product that they see that um, when they purchase it from us delights them. Um, and so that's what we're kind of looking for. And so usually the brands that we purchase kind of have that already in place, but if, you know, if there's work to be done, that's where we structure our first couple of months um, post acquisition of getting the brand correct, getting the creative correct. We have a fantastic creative team that really tries to understand what the customer psychology is behind the purchasing decision, which varies across our portfolio. We're in, we're in you know, more than 150 subcategories. We've acquired, you know, more than a dozen brands at this point. So our, our, our reach in terms of customer psychographics is getting more and more broad. Um, so that means like, you know, we can't, we can't just have a one size fits all model. We have to really understand the brand that we're buying, who we're partnering with, and then put the resources within the company um, that we have today into the right channels to be able to maximize the growth that makes sense for that brand. So that's, that's, that's how we approach sort of the value that we add post acquisition to, to a company, to a brand that we, that we purchase. And, and that's perfect, you know, like working with a ton of different brands, you know, and working with a ton of different sellers, et cetera, like what do you see are some of the biggest fail points for these types of brands whenever they go to sell their businesses? Yeah, it's, um, it, it, you know, it, it kind of harkens back to what I mentioned before where the space is moving so fast. Um, there's a lot of capital coming into the market, at least on the acquisition side. And I think, um, and, and also, uh, you know, the majority of the entrepreneurs and founders that I speak with, um, some of them have experience selling businesses before and they're serial entrepreneurs. And some of them are really, really awesome product, and like, you know, operations speak folks. And so they don't necessarily have the context around like, what questions should I be asking the acquirer? Um, and, I, and I think just like every brand isn't one size fits all, not every acquirer is one size fits all. And so one of the things recently that I, you know, we've heard is a big pain point for sellers is, you know, we thought we had a, you know, we thought we had an agreement um, and I was, you know, really excited to kind of realize the value for what I've created. Um, but it turns out the capital wasn't available or the diligence process post, you know, signing of the, what's called an LOI, a letter of intent, the agreement between the buyer and the seller. Um, the diligence process wasn't tight enough. So it took a really long time. We actually couldn't get there. There's nothing more exasperating than thinking that you're going to sell your business for, for a price and for terms that, that just blow you away and make you excited. And then realizing that that's not actually going to be the case. Um, so I think that's, that's a big fail point for sellers is just making sure that who you partner with when they put their, when they put their signature on a piece of paper and said, you know, here's what we're going to do and here's what we're going to partner with you, barring any sort of catastrophic, you know, something that happens in this, you know, in this window between that and, and when you close, which is why we try to make the window as short as possible. Um, you know, you just really want to make sure that they're going to be there for you at the end of the day. And, um, and also not just at the end of the day, but also close close, right? With what I was talking about, we want to continue to be in contact with the folks we partner with. Um, these are their brands. These are their babies. Um, and so we want to do the best that we can to, to sort of make sure that they're continuing to have insight into what, what we're doing with the brand, give 
them input if possible um, so that they can still feel connected even after they've gone on to the next thing. So I'd say it comes back to the trust thing that we were talking about earlier, making sure that the trust is there so that folks are going to close when they say they're going to close um, at the terms they say they're going to close on. And then also have the operating capability and experience to know that the brand is actually going to go on to new heights after, after the transaction is all said and done with. Yeah. Like, and, and that's perfect because, you know, one of the things between Sunken Stone and D1 Brands, we, we overlap because we're both operators on Amazon, right? And it brings us right into our next transition subject. Uh, why did D1 Brands and Sunken Stone decide to partner up? Yeah, um, you know, it, it was it was it was really kind of serendipitous. I, I think I was having a, a conversation with one of your colleagues, and, and I really started to understand that wow, you know, Sunken Stone has the same view of Amazon that we do. Very different models, um, and obviously, you know, as you said, the overlap here is just operating on Amazon. This is a this is a complicated space. Uh, I think folks can kind of get into the model of like you know it's just a you just buy it and you just run a consistent process and it matter it doesn't matter which kind of brand you're talking about. There's there's a lot of competition on Amazon. It get, it gets you know more com, you know competitive every single year. There's more dollars flowing into the space. And so unless you really really know what you're doing, um, things can get away from you. And what I really appreciated about something so at least the conversations that I had is that the operating sophistication. The, the, you know, the appreciation of how hard it is to operate brands on Amazon um, was there from the beginning. And so I've had a lot of conversations, you know, I know with, with you and with other of your colleagues around just sort of, you know, th thinking through what's the right way to staff these, these businesses. Um, what's the best strategy around marketing versus, versus, you know, like staying in stock versus when do you change price? All of these kind of con like conversations, decision points that go into, you know, running a successful business in a space that, we're sort of creating right now, right? There's not really a set playbook for this. This, this industry is relatively new. And so having those conversations initially with Sunken Stone around trying to figure this out, um, we're really encouraging. And so I think as you know, referral partners, as well as just kind of thought leaders within the industry, I think the more folks like Sunken Stone that kind of come up through the channel and get exposure on media and get, you know, leave really good impressions on their clients, the more professional the space is going to get, the better experience everyone's going to have. And so those were the those are the impressions that I got early on, and like I said, early days of the partnership, but it's been it's been fantastic so far. That that is absolutely amazing, Zach. So let me ask you this: If somebody that's watching this or listening to this right now, if they wanted to get into contact with D1 Brands and they wanted to sell uh, their business or start looking at like getting an evaluation, right? How would somebody get in contact with you? Yeah, so I, I would say definitely you check out our website. Um, you know, so D1 brands, um, dot IO. And so in the, there we have a landing page for folks to sort of submit a couple of pieces of information about their brand. Um, it'll come to me, it'll hit my inbox. I think while we've been talking, I've gotten a couple of them. Um, and so these are, and that's the best part of my job is just to, is just to kind of understand someone's brand, have an initial conversation with them, understand what's important to them. So I'd say, I'd say, go to the website and, and check us out first, make sure that, um, you know, what you see there and who we say we are, um, is something that you might be interested in. And then, and then if you want to have a conversation with, with us and me, you know, me and the rest of my team, our operators as well, um, you know, just send us a note and we'd be, we'd be more than happy to have an initial conversation. Yeah, so if you want to check out Zach and the whole D1 Brands team, there's going to be a link in the description box below this video to go to d1brands.io. Um, there's also going to be a link in the description box below this video to email the acquisitions team, which that's going to be acquisitions at d1brands.io in the description box below this video. Zach, I do appreciate you being on the show with me this morning. Um, but in closing, I just want to say a couple of different things. So D1 Brands is a global operator of e-commerce brands focused on the FBA channel. As a team of Amazon native operators, D1 is uniquely equipped to partner with founders, making a fantastic value and home for the Amazon brands they've built. With a team of 75 plus Amazon focused operators, a global operating infrastructure, and a dedicated team of acquisition professionals, D1 Brands is the ultimate partner to have when selling your Amazon business.